Imagine a world where you can move freely around your local area, participate in everyday activities and have a voice in the decisions that impact your own life and the life of your community. Perhaps you don't need to imagine this because this is your everyday life. Well, for many people around the world, and indeed one in five Australians, this is not an automatic reality. Approximately 4.3 million Australians today have disability, and many experience barriers, isolation and exclusion. I'm an educator and I've supported young people with disability for over 20 years. This is an area of injustice that I'm committed to changing. So I'm here today to challenge you about some of the messages that you've heard about disability and encourage you to be part of the solution to a more accessible and inclusive world. So let's have a look at three images and think about their underlying messages. What do you think of when you see this image? The wheelchair icon has had several names and is now known as the international symbol of access. I can see a navy blue background and a white figure representing a person sitting in a wheelchair. This image was first designed in the 1960s by Suzanne Cover, who was a Danish design student at the time. Now, interestingly, it was first designed without the circle at the top because it was designed to represent the wheelchair as an assistive device. The head was added later after feedback from the design committee, thus now representing a person sitting in that wheelchair. Now this small addition may not seem relevant to point out and yet it has particular significance for those who have been objectified by being viewed solely as an extension of their wheelchair. This image is static. It gives an impression of passivity and the person's been added almost as an afterthought. In Australia, we see this image most commonly in elevators, bathroom doors, on public transport, at building entrances, and in 2015, it became an emoji. In the late 1960s and 1970s, Mike Oliver and other disability activists were campaigning for the rights of people with disability. Mike believed that it was not the impairment or diagnosis that disabled an individual. It was an inaccessible environment. Let's stop and think about that for a moment. An inaccessible environment excludes and disables a person. It was Mike's passion and commitment to human rights that led to the social model of disability that we aspire to today. So let's have a look at the second image and think about how it's different from the first. In 2011, Sarah Hendren and Brian Glennie from the Accessible Icon Project in the UK created this image as part of a design activism campaign to challenge the previous wheelchair icon. Let me describe it for you. It has the same navy blue background. It has a white figure representing a person. However, this person is leaning forward and their arms are reaching backwards. There are broken lines in the wheelchair, which give an impression of the wheelchair being propelled forward by the person seated in it. This second image aligns well with the social model of disability as it shows an active, rather than objectified person. And the focus here is on the community in providing an accessible environment for this person who's on their way somewhere. How accessible is the environment where you live? So both of these images were created and designed to represent physical accessibility. However, they have come to represent disability in a number of other accessibility contexts. And as a result, we are socially conditioned to see and associate the physical characteristics with the experience of disability. Now, while this does represent 79% of Australians with disability, there is part of the story that is being untold by these two images. The remaining one in five Australians with hidden or invisible disability. This might be your neighbour with dyslexia or your school friend with juvenile arthritis. 
Hidden disability refers to any diagnosis or impairment that cannot be easily seen by others. And as a result, the individual experiences exclusion and an inaccessible environment. So let's now have a look at the third image. In 2018, New South Wales launched a campaign called Think Outside the Chair. The campaign was to raise awareness of Australians with hidden disability and followed examples of stigma and discrimination that individuals were experiencing in the local community. So what's the solution? How do we know about accessibility issues if we cannot see them? Well, the seven universal design principles are able to help us here. These universal design principles were originally created to address the design of built environments and architecture, but they have since been adapted to learning and social environments, as well as the provision of goods and services. Universal design principles attempt to address the needs of as many people as possible, both with and without disability, thus decreasing the need for retrofitting and adaptation and increasing inclusion in the first instance. Let's say you are coming home from work. You arrive at the train station. There's, the platform is filled with people. You hop onto a train carriage and you sit down. The train heads off and the noise increases as people talk over each other and talk over the sounds of the train as it moves along the tracks. You take out your phone to catch up on the latest episode of your favourite TV show. And then you realise you've left your headphones at work. What are you going to do? You're going to stare blankly out the window for the next half an hour? Or perhaps you turn on closed captions. You see, closed captions are an example of universal design principles that have a benefit for everyone. Closed captions increase cognition and comprehension. And they use the universal design principles of equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, and perceptible information. The people who benefit most from closed captions include adults and children who are learning to read, those who are deaf or hard of hearing, and those that are non-native language learners. In this example, closed captions are a convenience, but for some, they are a necessity. Let's get back to your journey home. So, the train reaches your local train station and you hop off the train. You assist an elderly lady to also get off the train with her shopping cart and the two of you walk side by side down the ramp towards the traffic lights. You look down. Curb cuts. Curb cuts are another example of universal design principles. You see, by creating a ramp from the curb to the road, this has a direct benefit for parents and prams, for those that are bike riders or couriers, for those who use scooters or wheelchairs, and of course, the elderly lady with her shopping cart. Curb cuts use the following universal design principles. Tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use. You see, in one trip home from work, you have encountered all seven universal design principles in a way that you may not have ever considered before. You see, these are everyday activities that many of us take for granted. And yet there are many other examples in our community and indeed around the world where universal design principles have not been utilised. And as a result, people with disabilities continue to be excluded. Let's have a look at the education system in Australia. We have an education system that provides the curriculum and methods for teaching Australian students and yet we still have Australian students with disabilities that are being excluded and directly and indirectly discriminated within the classroom. Legislation has been created to try and address 
this discrimination by providing accommodations and adjustments that a student may be able to access. However, I would argue that some of these adjustments and accommodations are in fact another opportunity to reinforce the exclusion. Rather than a more radical approach of overhauling the education system that has created the exclusion in the first instance. So, in order to utilise the benefits of these seven universal design principles, governments, businesses, community organisations and individuals all have a really important part to play. We must be committed to co-designing and co-creating spaces with people with disabilities in order that all voices in the community are heard, from the design to the implementation of physical environments, social and learning environments, and the provision of goods and services. So what can you do in your local community to ensure that spaces are accessible? Are you aware of a disability action plan that outlines your community's commitment to inclusion? Do you know of a disability advisory committee? And are their knowledge and expertise being asked for in terms of new developments? The next time your church group, your community organisation or your sporting club runs an event, I would encourage you to look at the seven universal design principles and consider all members of your community, both with and without disability. For if we focus on these principles, rather than relying on the one element of disability that we can see, then together we will move forward to a more accessible and inclusive world. Thank you.